So uh, welcome everybody. This is our last, uh, I guess one before last, we're going to have Stephen Anderson next week to do a bit more of a fun uh, topic around civic design and how to use like uh, cards and board uh, game to kind of like create some kind of like facilitation technique. But today we're going to be talking about a bit of a, of a different topic with Megan Miller, who's been uh, our friends for a long time. So let me just go ahead and get started today as we are winding down the summer of service design. Um, let me see if I can share this. Um, so once again, thank you to our sponsors, Slalom and Precocity have been with us for uh, basically the whole entire time of uh, COVID and post-COVID. So thank you to Slalom and Precocity for sponsoring our events and allowing us to bring you some service design content all over the world. We constantly have people from all the way to Australia and China joining us. So this is in Dallas, but we have definitely uh, opened up the, the boundaries of what's possible through COVID. Um, so once again, this is Service and Dallas. So I am Greg like Luffy, and we have Brendan, Robin, and Brenda with us. Um, and today we're going to be uh, recording this session as always. So if you haven't had a chance to look past, I think we have 60 something sessions to record in over the past several years. Uh, to, today's session will be probably recorded and uploaded on YouTube tonight or tomorrow. So if you have missed it or you're going to miss the end of it, or you want to share with somebody in your office, definitely send the link to our YouTube channel and you can look at all those uh, past uh, series and luminaries, uh, including Megan uh, with us today. Um, super quick, as Brennan was talking about, uh, we're going to try to keep the chat engaged and fun as, as always. If you have a specific question for Megan, please make it obvious to uh, let them know like this is a question for Megan so we can capture that and kind of like uh, give it to Megan when she's finished doing her presentation. So make it clear it's actually a question, not something that you want to just chat about in the, in the meeting. Um, Today we're going to talk about pretty important uh, soft skill or secret power of service design, which is co-creating through conflict, right? So we try to keep the service design knowledge pretty broad, some some fun blueprinting stuff all the way to like futurism. Uh, and sometimes we try to keep it a bit more like, what else can service design do that is not in the books, right? So everybody has read the books, you may have gone to school uh, for service design, but there's always this kind of like soft skills that are popping up. Uh, and a very important one is um, uh, being able to be that diplomat, uh, that person who's actually going to be able to listen, understand, and kind of like mitigate risk uh, and problems through the different uh, um, uh, projects you're on. So that happens to me literally every day. You have to be that person who has this catalyst for change, but also kind of like understand that there's a problem here and you're going to be the person kind of like going in and trying to make it work. Uh, and it's not an easy skill to to, to get. Uh, it takes obviously empathy and sympathy, but also have really strong communication skills, understanding skills, and also be able to mitigate uh, different uh, difficult uh, personalities sometimes to work with. So Megan is going to join us. Um, if you have not met Megan, if you know who Megan is, I might give her a couple of minutes to introduce herself. Um, Megan, welcome back. Tell us a bit about yourself. Great. Yeah, it's really fun to be back uh, in this series. Um, it's been several years uh, and it's always nice to connect with the whole community. I always feel like, oh, there's my people. So hello, my people. I'm so excited to see you all. So I am Senior Director of Service Design and Facilitation at Stan Stanford University. I have been building an in-house service design team for, I think I'm in year eight now. Um, and I've worked at Stanford University for uh, a long time, 17, 18 years. Um, on the side, Eric and I have uh, a side business called Practical by Design. And um, we co-founded that many years ago. And many of you might be familiar with our um, experience blueprinting methodology that we have online courses for and um, toolkits and templates and blog posts and all sorts of stuff and our Slack community, Practical Service Design Slack community. So yeah, very, very excited to be here today. Um, super passionate about uh, growing our field and our practice. And in particular, this topic of conflict has been the thing, the edge of my growth over the last three years. So getting into the conflict mediation space as a facilitator and really unpacking that and developing my skills has been pretty illuminating and has drastically changed how I approach the work. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So yeah, are we ready to get started? Should I share my I just want to let or? No, uh, Megan delivered a very similar uh, presentation a few months ago, I think it was in May, 
in the Service Design Network uh, Next Generation Conference. Um, yep. so if you have seen that, you have a chance to hear it again and this time ask a lot of questions. And if you have not been able to catch uh, Megan back in May, this is basically uh, a part two of the same uh, meeting. So Megan, it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. This was uh, the closing keynote for the SDN Next Gen Conference. And it was so fun to be part of that crew and meet all the young emerging talent that's coming in our field and just their perspectives on the world. So highly recommend if you're ever thinking of being part of that conference. And there were some really amazing um, like uh, portfolio type review sessions and feedback sessions as part of it. It was really, really cool. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully everyone, is that, everyone can see the slides all right? I'm tiling all of you. So if you do put your videos on, I can see your smiling faces. It's up to you. Consent, of course. Um, all right. So let's talk about this, co-creating through conflict, what I'm calling the hidden power of service design. So this point in time in the history of our planet and our society and our species comes with a great challenge and complexity. The problems that we are dealing with in the workplace and in our lives are daunting. And one thing remains constant, even in the face of all that great change, and that is it comes down to people. Being human has not changed, though the world around us has. And you, service designers, service design community, you are agents of change, even though it might not feel that way today. And the reason you are an agent of change is because service design puts us in this unique position of mediating conflict. We can benefit from gaining these skills in conflict mediation to aid in our practice. And so that's what this talk is going to be about today. So you are in service design because you want to make an impact. You want to spark transformation in the work you do, in the spaces you work, and in the world. But it can feel super daunting when we're faced with the realities of working on a complex problem with a diverse set of people in a complicated organization. So let's kind of set the scene and we'll dig into this a bit. So imagine you're walking into a kickoff meeting for a new ambitious service design project that's gonna be transforming a city waste program. This is like a, an effort to reduce emissions and meet zero waste goals. So just imagine you're kind of getting into this space. It's a super inspiring project. And there are lots of different players involved. You could imagine there's the local government, there's policymakers, there are local businesses, the community, the city council, the waste service provider, and of course, you know, everybody else. Each party comes with their own motivation and interests, and each has their own level of power and influence. So you are brought in to make sense of the situation and guide this group toward a solution. But as you open up the workshop, lots of different viewpoints emerge. What are the financial implications? This is going to cost so much. It should be the city's responsibility to address this, not ours. It's a consumer problem. We need better waste sorting. These perspectives are seemingly at odds with each other. And the more that everyone shares, the more intractable they seem on their viewpoints. The debate heats up and it's not just your workshop that needs saving. How are we gonna solve these challenging problems if we can't come together? How can we co-create a solution if we can't agree on fundamental values? So we don't talk about conflict in service design, but we should, and here's why. Service design tackles bigger problem spaces. And the bigger the problem space, the more the stakeholders must be engaged, the more stakeholders, the more complexity. And service design really requires us to engage in this complexity and be able to navigate it. The bigger we go, the more we encounter division and fundamental differences in values, beliefs, uh, identities, power, motivation, interests, positions, personalities, the baggage that comes with the history of whoever is working together and the level of influence that people have. And there are real stakes on the table on all sides. Anytime you're working with people in different positions of power and influence with different drivers and motivations, you are going to find conflict. So conflict is natural. This is part of being human. We are not trying to stifle conflict. We are not trying to change humans from the way that they are. We're not trying to kill and break all the silos. We are trying to find a way to navigate it and work co uh, collectively together through it. So let's talk about conflict for a bit. 
we've evolved a threat response system as a way to protect ourselves as human biological beings in the world, right? This same system, though, gets triggered regardless of whether this is a real threat or a perceived threat. And so the stressors that activate your amygdala in the brain release these cocktails of hormones triggering fight, flight, freeze, appease response. And so we have to recognize that when we are in a work situation, we might be getting triggered. Others in this situation might be getting triggered, whether it's realistic, like a saber toothed tiger chasing after us or perceived. So let's talk a little bit about perceived threats, because that's mostly what we're dealing with in the workplace, fortunately. Um, perceived threat can equally activate this stress response. And in our work, we have lots of examples of this. So different symbolic threats can appear when perceived differences make an in-group feel like the out-group poses a threat to their group morals, standards, beliefs, or attitudes. You might start seeing this when you start hearing like an us versus them um, talk going on in organizations. That's kind of in-group, out-group, right? These threats are tied to a group's sense of identity. And when you trigger identity threat, it's very difficult to engage. You know, I'm a developer, that's an identity right? I'm a designer. That's an identity. Um, additional, uh, additionally, in, in addition to identity threat, a stereotype threat can cause people to feel at risk of conforming to stereotypes about their social group in certain situations. And there's lots of other psychological factors such as uncertainty, perceived risk in the future, what might happen, and even that inner critic can all trigger that threat response in your brain. And I'm sure all of us coming out of the pandemic are very familiar with this threat response. Uh, this only means we have to take care of ourselves and develop mental fitness, as uh, Simon Sinek likes to say. Um, we have to be aware that this threat response abounds in others and be compassionate and recognize this in our work. So I have a model that I really like uh, to use. This is called the SCARF model. Um, it's a super useful way to look at different dimensions that are at play in a group setting. So these five key domains influence our behavior in social situations. Um, status, which is how we perceive our relative importance to others. Certainty, our ability to predict the future. Um, autonomy, our sense of control over events. Relatedness, how safe we feel with others. And fairness, are we getting treated fairly? Um, and so you can see over here on the right, these are the statements when you're feeling calm and, and confident and safe, you are vet feeling valuable, I feel certain, I have a choice, I belong, I'm treated fairly. But when these things get triggered, the opposite gets true. So this is a helpful way to maybe break down, like, are we having a status threat? Or is it that we have too much ambiguity in our project? Or are people feeling too micromanaged and we need to give them more autonomy? Um, are we feeling safe with others or is it really an us versus them and we're not feeling safe? Or is something going on in the structure that's making people feel like it's not fair? So super helpful model. In other words, conflict is present in any space there are people. And so last time I checked, we're all still human, right? However, conflict is not inherently bad. So beyond this threat response, keeping us safe across evolutionary history, there are actually lots of benefits to having conflict in the workplace. Um, conflict encourages diverse perspectives. It stimulates critical thinking, helps us examine assumptions and clarify our reasoning and evaluate alternatives. It enhances our creativity and innovation. It can be a catalyst for brainstorming. This clash can lead to new ideas and push boundaries and have more out of the box thinking. It can promote deeper understanding. So if you want to get to different perspectives, have active listening and ultimately develop greater empathy. Um, and it can strengthen our decision-making process. It can help us get to a rigorous uh, decision-making uh, process that's robust and leads to well-informed choices. Um, and then lastly, it can build stronger relationships with more resilience, respect, and collaboration in your teams. So now let's shift gears and we're gonna talk about how conflict shows up specifically in service design work. So service design requires navigating many levels of Zoom. Sometimes we're all the way down at the touch point level. Sometimes we have to go up into the business strategy stratosphere. And this is inherently why service design is a very hard discipline. So I want to just affirm and recognize all of you for taking on this extremely challenging thing that we want to all do together called service design. Um, we sit in like the, the sandwich in the business 
where, you know, we got bread on both sides and it's tough sometimes, right? It's tough to navigate this. Um, you have to be adept at the methodology at each level and also be able to effectively work in your organization and engage on these different levels, right? So you have to be a facilitator of the process, engaging and orchestrating the right stakeholders. And you might feel comfortable in your focus at the level of service experience or user experience or maybe service strategy, um, but you have to work to develop business acumen and leadership skills and experience to navigate these higher levels and of course leverage the right skill sets to, to work at the touch point level. Now, because service design in practice requires working across these levels of the organization, we will encounter conflict because there are inherently conflicting positions, viewpoints, and drivers from the stakeholders who, who sit primarily at these levels of Zoom, right? So down here, you might have product designers. Um, up here, you might have you know, senior leaders or the C-suite. And when we go from level to level, there is disagreement of values. This is natural and it is part of a healthy ecosystem of a company. Um, but we have to recognize that we are navigating a system that balances conflicting drivers and interests. So, okay, conflict scenarios in service design. There are three ways that conflict shows up specifically in service design work that I wanna talk through. During discovery, this is in user research. During design, this is co-creation. And during implementation, this is decision-making. So design research puts us in a position to mediate between levels of power. I want that to sink in for you. And if you if you haven't thought of this, thought of research this way before, I hope I hope this can be a bit of a like, oh my gosh, because for me it was several years ago when I realized we are being advocates and we are mediating between someone with power, positions of power, the sponsors, and those in positions of lesser power. And why was it so attractive to me to be a service designer and try to be the one holding the empathy and the advocacy for the end user? And it really is a mediation role. So um, this requires, in, in many ways, this is fraught and it is a tough position to be in. And there are con there's a conflict of interest. You are hired by your sponsor to go do this user research on behalf of the business. Um, and yet we try to serve the user's interests and advocate for user needs. This is inherently challenging in user research work, right? Um, you are in a position of power over the, the users that you are trying to research and eventually serve, particularly marginalized users who are um, represented, who are maybe not represented in your sponsor group or the business group that's hired you or brought you in, um, but also you know in other spaces as well. Um, so you speak for them, hence advocacy, not allyship, and doing so from a position as a researcher where you're beholden to the people who hired you. So you have to navigate the ethics between you and the user community um, and the power differential there uh, and the power that you hold, right? Um, and navigating the ethics of being paid by those sponsors um, where you have less power than the people paying you. And I'm using paying loosely. I'm an in-house consulting group. We actually do get paid. But um, you know, even if you're in-house, you still have a sponsor saying you can put your time on things. So you know, allyship is actively supporting people from marginalized groups versus advocacy is proactively taking action to build relationships across those groups and drive the positive structural change and systemic issue. If you can bring more marginalized voices into your research process, even have them on your synthesis review team or um, on the team designing the research approach, that's even better. But this is a challenging position to be in and it is a position of mediation by nature. Now let's talk about design. So co-creation brings these diverse viewpoints together, but those in the room are not gonna be aligned. And so what motivates and drives our stakeholders is very different. Our sponsor, our project team, our leadership, the impacted audiences, the developers, the marketing team, right? I mean, everybody comes from a different place. And then if you add on this lens of system thinking and non-human stakeholders who are not present, like the environment at the table, I mean, it gets even more complicated, right? And so we have to really be able to facilitate and mediate these diverse and conflicting drivers and, and viewpoints um, to effectively co-create together. And then the last, um, the last one I'm going to highlight here is during implementation. And 
I know this is a very tough in service design where we often work gets put on a shelf and never implemented, right? Um, super painful. But when we do have that chance to help uh, help guide an implementation of a design project, um, our role at that phase in a project as a service designer is supporting the right decision making, right? And in this phase, we continue in our advocacy role and become mediators in an ongoing negotiation between what the audience needs and desires and what the organization is willing and able to deliver. We actually facilitate the negotiation process if we have a seat at the table and that's how it should be. Um, and so we have to think of ourselves as mediators. I see someone's having, having fun annotating on the, on the slide here. All right. But how can conflict mediation help us? So how does this help us facilitate the co-creation of solutions? How can we apply this in practice? Okay. In the face of wicked problem solving and intractable conflict, the state of the world, it can seem impossible. There are so many reasons why this is hard and all the reasons why it won't work. The world is divided, false information abounds, identities collide, it feels like we can never see eye to eye. So how can we ever solve this? How can we get everyone on the same page? How can a design workshop and some stickies help? And you might be wondering if you even have what it takes. And at first, you know, when we're entering into service design, we might not, and we might not know the language of the business or have the position, authority, or influence, or even the access to the parts of the organization that we need to do this work. You might be feeling like an imposter I do even to this day sometimes. You feel you might feel like it's impossible to get to work on the things that actually make a difference. And I just want to echo to everyone, like service design is hard. This is hard and you will likely fail and that is okay. Um, that is part of what this field is about. And I want to, I hope this talk helps you understand maybe why it's hard. You're not just designing like an interface here. You are facilitating conflict all the time. So embracing conflict in your practice can help accelerate your effectiveness as a service designer. And so I'm gonna share some tips now on ways to do this. First, building trust and shared understanding. Two important ways that you should actively work to build trust in your projects. The first is between you and your stakeholders. Um, you are the designer and the facilitator of a service design process. You have to earn their trust to be their guide. And the second is between your stakeholders. Um, in order to effectively engage a diverse group, you gotta get them to trust each other. And sometimes you all you have is one workshop, right? So how do we do this? Um, my man, Simon, a team is not a group of people. Who work together a team is a group of people who trust each other so we have to work on building trust um i have a wonderful resource i'm sharing with you now which is called charles feltman's thin book of trust it's a stellar book it's only 70 pages uh, it's a great framework and he defines trust as choosing to risk making something you value vulnerable to another person's actions um i'll have to let you sit with that a little longer uh later in the day because i'm gonna keep moving but it's really powerful um, and he states there are four dimensions to building and maintaining trust. So care, genuinely caring about the other person, their interests, demonstrating you have their interests in mind. Feltman says this might be the single most important aspect of building trust. Reliability, that means doing what you say you're gonna do and honoring your commitments. Sincerity, you are honest, you can be believed and taken seriously and competence. You have the ability, capacity, capability, skills, and knowledge to do the work. And so if you can demonstrate these qualities in your work and find ways to help your stakeholders build relationship and gain shared understanding and demonstrate these qualities to each other, it can go a long way toward building trust. So some concrete ways to do this in your service design work. Make time for building that understanding and connection and for your stakeholders to actually get to know each other and build relationships and find things in common. Have them participate in research. Um, have them practice active listening, like teach them how to do that. Have them present the other person's viewpoints and interests. So if you're noticing there are um, conflicting viewpoints in your team, you can say, let's pause. Let's make sure we understand each other. Um, you know, 
Fred, can you reiterate what Jane said and say it in your own words? And let's make sure we're understanding each other. A very powerful technique. So the second thing I recommend is to separate the people from the problem. This is easier said than done, but here are some tips. People will often lead by stating their positions. A position is something like, well, we must do it this way, or this is the way it's always been done, or I will only, I can only do it, blah, 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 right? I mean, it's a, it's a strong stance. It's a position of what they want or need or can do. Um, this is um, tied to the individual. And so you need to listen actively and explore the emotions and learn to recognize the difference between an interest which is like the underlying reasons, values, or motivations that explain why they're taking the position and the position. And once this, you know, once this switch happened for me, it unlocks so much more um, productive conversation because I can see when someone's taking a position, but I can ask those great questions to get down to their interest. And once we align on the interest level, we can find compromises that work. So we got to disentangle the relationship from the problem space. And um, this is another really great framework called the TRIP framework that I use. Um, if you're having trouble engaging a set of stakeholders around a topic, you can use this to step back and assess where you need to focus and engage. So the TRIP framework des describes four types of goals that people have. Um, they may have a, a topic goal, which is content. It's like what each party wants. It's easy to identify this. A relationship goal, which is how we want to interface with each other, how we want to collaborate and treat each other. An identity goal, what do we want others to see of us, how we present publicly, and a process goal, um, how communication and conflict occurs, what are our rules for managing this conflict. So you can use this as a framework just to reflect and think, well, wait, where's the problem? Is this a process problem, a topic problem, a relationship problem, or an identity problem? And if you can properly diagnose it, you can choose where to focus to be most effective. So I would encourage you for all of this, employ your design research toolkit. We are already well equipped, equipped to do this work. Um, active inquiry, active listening, empathy, using five whys, problem tree analysis. I mean, you pick, you pick your favorite method here, but your design research toolkit will serve you in understanding and empathizing with your stakeholders and building that trust. Okay, number three, design and facilitate the process like a mediator. So you should internalize and understand the stages of conflict mediation. I have these here on the right. And as I read through these, does it look familiar? Well, it does because it does a direct parallel um, to the way we approach work generally in the service design world. Um, step one, agree on the approach and the roles we are gonna have. Step two, gather points of view. Step three, identify the issues and interests. Step four, develop options. Step five, evaluate those options. And step six, create agreement. So I would encourage you to, on a meta level, apply this framework, which is so, so similar to our design thinking framework, to your project as a whole. How are you and your stakeholders agreeing on how you work together? How are you, as the facilitator of this process, going to gather everyone's points of view? How are you going to identify the issues and interests up front in your project so that you're all aligned? Um, and then how will you develop mutually ag agreeable options? So facilitate like a mediator. Do your homework. Uh, you got, uh, I encourage meeting one-on-one, -on -one, really understanding people's points of view, building that trust. Go into your group setting, knowing the positions and interests of your participants. Staying neutral. Acknowledge, but don't validate points of view. If you're the facilitator, you shouldn't be saying so-and-so, oh, I, that's so horrible. Oh, yeah, we should fix that. Like, you can acknowledge, say, oh, that's, that sounds really hard. Let's hear what the other person has to say. Help everyone be seen and heard. Reflect back and check understanding. Summarize in your own words and make sure that the group all understands. And then design the conversation. Use more one-on-ones. Use the flow of the meetings to unpack the problem. Create safe spaces. Um, consider smaller groups or maybe groups by segment, um, and then how and when to bring in those diverse audiences together in the same room. And then lastly, as Priya Parker says, you've got to lead with gracious authority. I love this as my motto, um, to guide the process, because as a facilitator, you are the authority of the process, um, and you can be gracious in that. Lastly, um, leverage co-creation to bridge the divide. And this is really the unique 
power of design and service design that we have, co-creation. Uh, co-creation is a core tenant in service design. This holds the secret power to bridge the divide. And when we bring people together to problem solve and engage as a team, we can separate the people from the problem and work as a single team. So it's not what you think that will make you successful as a service designer. You can have as many frameworks uh, and templates as you want, but if you can't navigate the people and the conflict, you will not be successful. So you can't just framework your way out of conflict. Knowing the design process and the methodology isn't enough. We have to navigate that human element and not just talk about empathy. We actually have to build shared understanding across the divide. And us as service designers, we need to step into this role as conflict mediators, explicitly helping different parties engage in a fair and balanced process uh, that diffuses conflict, engages in concrete problem solving, um, and is brave. So have the courage to engage human to human and build skills that don't normally come as part of a design toolkit. You are here to affect change, to make an impact and enable transformation. Service design as a practice has the potential to facilitate this change for the world, even some of the most challenging problems of our day. And as we turn our attention to these great challenges, there is going to be conflict. We live in this divided world, but if we work through conflict together, we can find those transformative solutions that are gonna lead us to a bright future. So um, bring diverse viewpoints together, do it by co-creating through conflict. Um, don't lose hope. <laughs> Service design is what the world needs now and for the future. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Megan. Great. Um, super quick before we start the question, somebody is asking if you are going to be sharing this uh, slide deck. They are already posted on my speaker deck profile, but I can definitely share the link out. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have to, but just like, you know. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, cool. So um, are there any questions, Robin and Brendan, from Megan? We don't have any direct questions from the group yet. Uh, and and I think the reason is every single slide was invigorating. Like that that was yeah. super, super cool. I, I was so engrossed in, in, in everything. And, it, and I think everybody's hanging on every word here. So uh, there wasn't a lot of side chatter, uh, actually. It was just people saying, amen, hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you preach, right? So um this it, we're starting to get them to come in. So here, here's the first one. It looks like um, NAE asks, could you le please provide some examples of where service design was positively or negatively affected by some of the techniques you mentioned? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of what I shared um, in that if you ignore this human element and you jump in thinking that you're gonna design some fancy workshop process to solve a problem, and if you ignore that human element and you go in kind of blind to your stakeholder landscape, uh, it can really backfire. And what that usually looks like in a workshop um, is some stakeholder might pull you aside and say, I can't work with this person or uh, like really stubborn viewpoints that basically halt your agenda. So if you've ever felt that like, oh my God, my plan is not going as planned feeling, that's because you overlooked some sort of human backstory element um, that could have been addressed up front. Um, and so a technique that I use when I'm scoping projects is I, I ask a, a number of questions to try to get red flags early around the stakeholder dynamic. I ask what has been tried before? Why didn't it work? Um, who's involved in this decision making process? You know, what have been some of the challenges? And I try to feel out um, the human side of it before I even come up with a project approach. And if I get any red flags, what I always do now is make sure we do one-on-ones with everyone involved ahead of a group, any sort of group thing. And I have a standard kind of questionnaire template that I use in my one-on-ones to dig into team collaboration and conflict issues specifically. Um, and I ask about, you know, how well do you understand the other team? What do you value of the other team? Um, what are some of the challenges when you're working together with this team? So I think sometimes we in and we we don't know we're stepping into a space where there's inter-team conflict. And of, of course, with service design work, you have to bring teams together. There's it's always cross-silo work. It's always interdisciplinary work. And so we need to get 
a sense and wrap our heads around the interests, motivations, drivers of each of the teams that we're engaging in a cross-disciplinary effort. And so sometimes that's just like I go meet with the leader of that team for a chat and like, what are you thinking? What are you hoping to get out of this project? If I need to bring everyone together for a workshop and I don't have time and space to do that homework up front, I always start with a activity around what does success look like for this project? What are our desired outcomes? And what that does is it unearths right away whether we have alignment around what we're trying to achieve in the effort, we're, whatever effort we're doing, or if there's something there that we need to uncover. And so usually I plan a kickoff session for projects that's very flexible and I start with that prompt and then I have a kind of flow of other activities we can go from there, but we might spend a lot of time on that. What does success look like? Because we got to get alignment before we even design the approach of the project. So hopefully that helps um, with some concrete examples. Uh, um, Megan, you, you mentioned earlier that no, you, and that is my preferred method, to have the one-on-one -on -one deep conversation, almost like therapy, right? I've, I've been to conversations before. I've been called a therapist at work, yes. 30 minutes, and then you end up like being an hour and a half talking about everything, right? So um, what is your what is your threshold between deciding having a one-on-one -on -one deep conversation and get to the bottom of it versus having... Uh, a workshop slash ideation session with like six, seven, eight, nine, ten people. And of course, you have to sure. get a group think and all the things about that. So, is it easier for you to create trust in this particular case with a one-on-one -on -one situation? Yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, and where do you where do you navigate the one-on-one -on -one versus the group think? Uh, that's that's great. So that comes back to my like two ways you need to build trust in a project, right? There's me and them. As a facilitator, I need to build trust. And the one-on-ones are great for that, right? I can really listen and empathize and understand them and reflect back what I'm hearing and be like, yeah, okay, we can work with this. I got your back, right? Um, and then in the group setting, you need to build the trust between them. And so depending on how sticky the situation is, so some I get I get brought in for projects that I would not call service design projects. I get brought in to these, I call them between two teams projects like between two firms with Zach Galifianakis, but it's between two teams with Megan Miller. Um, and <laughs> those projects, they end up having a service design output in many ways, because let's say these two teams are joined at the hip to deliver a service. And the reason they're calling me is because they are struggling to get along and it's impacting their service delivery. And it's creating an experience that's bad or they're not meeting their SLAs or whatever their goals are, right? So. For those projects, I know right away it's a conflict project and I do one-on-ones and I time box it 30 minutes and I have my script. I treat it like an interview process and I do synthesis and then I present back to the team everything I heard. So we do, a, I mean, I'm like the hard truth girl. I come in and like, all right, here's what here's what you said. Sometimes if I don't have time, I do a survey. So I, I do a, some, a, a light survey in advance of a team retreat and I use that to design the agenda. Um, but we're kind of talking about like, yeah, me building trust and then building trust between them. If we really have to solve this inter-team conflict in order to deliver a great service experience, then most of what we spend time on is how are we communicating and collaborating and building relationships. So I do a lot of like icebreakers and get to know each other's and on-sites and um, spend time there. And the leadership recognizes that it's essential. If you're going to deliver great services in a cross siloed service model, you got to have that. So th th I think that's how I got into this work in the first place, right? Because service design is so cross silo and to get anything done, you're running up against this inter-team conflict. So the second part of this, that once you actually done all that stuff and always use API as your positive intent, um, there are no bad people, right? So to speak, yeah. maybe there's an agenda, right? So when you are in a place where people are kind of like high-fiving, great session, blah, 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 and then you start seeing cracks in the trust, right? Those people have agreed to do so, but they really don't want to, or they can't, or budget, or resources, or whatever, right? You have those those macro agenda that start popping up and kind of like, you have yeah. to do it because you're the mediator, right? So yeah. you've a really good job at creating synergy, and people are really liking each other on day one, and then day five or day 25, things start to crumble. So yeah, how when you, the rubber hits the road, yeah, and yeah. you're making decisions. Yep. Yeah. So how do you how do you handle? Yeah. yeah. So when the rubber meets the road, and it, we're getting down to actual decision making, and it's not just discovery anymore, it's not just visioning, but we're saying, okay, what are we going to do? What are our commitments? 
mean, the best thing to do in that situation is try to get an open conversation to happen around the limitations, the constraints, the motivations and interests. Um, if you often at that point in a project, if things are starting to go off rail, that's when I bust out my one on ones again. I'm like, I'm going to just go check on this person. Like, what's going on here? And try to go, oh, OK, I see there's something happening here. And then if we need to have a group discussion where I'm mediating between what's now emerging as a real conflict of interest, um, we can just call it what it is. And so I try to cultivate a kind of let's it, if you're just holding it in behind a closed door, like we're not going to get anything done. We got to attack the problem as a group, as a team. And so we take a lot of like one team approach to separating people from the problem. And then getting it all out there. So saying like, here's team A's interests and concerns and motivations. Here's team B's interests, concerns and motivations. Now let's all step to the other side of the table and we're going to be a singular problem solving team. So do you recommend introducing um, an alignment framework so to speak? We have some touch points for like first week, great alignment. And then kind of like knowing that this probably will happen, you actually schedule like a, an arbitrary or proactive realignment workshop or whatever week three and week mm -hmm. six week nine make sure i mean that's so unique to the project so no i don't i don't plan for this step here but um it's something i'm we monitor in a project um and we have you know regular check-ins with our key project um clients um to make sure we're in alignment and that if we're picking up on something like do we need to pause what we we're doing to kind of go a different way so a lot of my projects are very fluid like we we plan it and we charter it and we get an approval and then by week two, it's changed. So that's just the way it is. <laughs> it is. Um, Robin, we have quite a few questions now, so I've lost track of it, but Robin, do you have a question for Megan? Yes, and you you guys have been doing a fantastic job actually answering several of the questions that have stacked up here uh, in the discussion. Um, I am gonna jump down to a question from Lee Parker. Um, and this is a particularly interesting one, uh, kind of asking for a little clarity on the role of the service designer per, say, a project manager mm -hmm. um, as far as navigating conflict or, mm -hmm. you know, avoiding the how many cooks you have in the kitchen situation we've all dealt with. Great question. And I'll share by first explaining the roles on my team. So I have a, I have a diverse service design team. And the reason is that I, I believe as a service design team, we have to navigate all those levels of Zoom. So I have on my team, I have a senior UX designer, I have a service designer, a senior service designer, a senior facilitator, um, a design project manager, and myself. Um, and so we take a really interdisciplinary approach to the work and different projects come in at different levels of Zoom. Uh, and I'm bringing this up to, just to share I am a big fan of having diverse skill sets on a project and like having a project manager on a project. Yes. Yep, exactly. Um, so yes, if you have access to a project manager resource, awesome. Um, spend time, if they're not part of your team, like spend time educating them before you work with them on like what the whole thing is that you're trying to do. Um, we've worked really hard actually to develop templates and explain how our methodology connects into typical project management life cycles to bring PMs on board. Um, but as far as the role of the, the lead, so we have a concept of a, of a project lead, and that would very likely not ever be the project manager. And our project leads always are the ones interfacing with the client and guiding the approach to the project. And so I would say you don't, the PM can be really helpful in spotting and identifying the conflict, like the landscape, the stakeholder landscape, but it is not the PM's job to resolve that conflict. And, and I am project manager, not product manager, but yeah, project manager. When you as a facilitator, you are the lead who is designing the approach and facilitating the process. So it's, it's your role to navigate that stakeholder landscape. Now, you don't need to do it alone. You should do it in partnership with your client um, sponsors and contacts. So let's say you have a core project team who has a, or it's a leader from each of the teams you're working with, right? Their job is to support you in navigating their teams and working with their teams. And so I think when I enter into a project, I'm always trying to treat, it's, it's a partnership. It's a partnership, but I am the owner of the process and the approach. So that's how we do it. I know, I know it could be different in different places, but that's how we do it. 
So there is a, a comment here from Thomas, you know, Austin, who is saying that his conflicts and issues are almost always with PMs. I do not have that experience. I've been very blessed. And I think Vinay is That's like, funny, Thomas. You know, or was he? I work with Vinay at Capital One. He was an amazing project manager slash product, you know, owners. Um, so I've been very grateful to have like PMs actually were working with me. They were like, you know, not yeah. challenging in any way. So I want to, I want to touch on this a little bit though. So Thomas, you're right. And like a PM who sits in like an IT org, which is where my team used to sit originally. Um, and I stole one of their PMs to my team. Uh, so it, like <laughs> there is very different mindset in some PM communities. And that's why I said, try to educate the whatever PM you're working with, like have a little orientation session with them. Say like, this is not gonna be your normal project. Here is how we are gonna work together. You're gonna meet with me every week and I'm gonna help you design your project plan. And I'm gonna watch you put it into Smartsheet and we're gonna work together on the dependencies and we're gonna integrate these steps and methodologies into your approach, right? I mean, you have to be a little hands-on if you're working with a PM that doesn't share your knowledge or mindset. Now, if you're working with a PM who also doesn't like your mindset and approach then you're then it's a tough situation so i totally i totally get how you could have pushback from a pm especially if you're working on digital services right and you're working with it and technical you know landscape but at the end of the day what what we iterate is the value you get back from taking a service design or a user experience i mean pick your pick your design flavor it doesn't matter taking a user centered approach to design saves rework time it saves um it saves change management issues oh they like the change management card's a good one pull, i pull that one a lot because even if we can't fix it in the system if you know what the problems are going to be you can get ahead of it in a change management strategy um so like assemble your kind of rationale for why this approach saves them time and again you're appealing to their interests you're appealing to what it cares about IT care, uh, cares about technical debt. They care about development costs. They care about rework. They care about loud and noisy customers, right? They care about client satisfaction. So I think you got to really get to know your audience and then appeal to their business interests. So a part two of this was like some of the most friction points I've had with my teams in the past was around agile. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're showing up as a designer and you have some really loose tasks, some really loose plan, and you're very like good at mediating and, and going yeah. with changes, right? And you go in a team who's not, you know, the team is working by sprints, they're working by points, they wonder what you're gonna be doing this week. And sometimes designers are like, I don't know, this is what it's called discovery. I don't know what I'm gonna be doing on week three. Um, how are you managing this kind of very tactical micro friction that you have to do with your team? Because obviously you don't want to be like rocking the boat. But you also need to be doing your job and being told like, okay, Greg, how many points is it going to be? And you're like, I, I don't know. This could be three points. This could be 13 points. So I just know <laughs> that I get it done. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes PMs are, don't really know how to handle that, right? Because they're just... Yeah, that's you know, true. So how, yeah. do you, how do you manage this kind of like... Well, micro so when we... Big... Yeah, when I, when I sat in a more agile team, what we used to do is carve out discovery sprints um, that fed into the dev sprints right so it's, it's almost like a little mini wave happening regularly um and i mean at any point you can choose what scope you want to bite off so there's some amount of like yeah you do a bunch of discovery you can shoot for the moon or you can like just go next door right so i think there's some choice in your selective prioritization in an agile environment to feed things in bite-sized chunks to your dev team um now, let's say you're trying to get that kind of dev team to participate in a service design process separate from their agile sprint process. I think doing that upfront education about what the process is and why it will benefit them and explaining how much time it will take for them. Like, I want two hours a week from you. That's it. That's it. You know, and and explain what the output's going to be. So like at the end of this process, we're going to result in this, this, this and this. We'll do a prioritization exercise and then this feeds your backlog. So I think it's you gotta like connect the dots of the story of how the work fits into their work and what they're looking for. So know, those are my tips around like working with an agile team. Uh Brendan, do you have are you okay on time again? Yeah, I'm good. Uh Brendan, do you have a question? I do. Ashley asks, 
what are some tools, discussions, or frameworks to resolve conflict in that decision-making or prioritization phase mm. of a project? Uh, we we'll right. sometimes use something like impact versus effort, but even uh, people disagree on that. <laughs> there are so many ways to slice and dice a prioritization step, um, depending on the the group and what you're trying to bite off. A simple dot vote can suffice, right? Um, the The way that I protect that phase of a project is I actually we, we charter and we end our charter at the phase of coming up with ideas. And because implementation is a whole different ball game and we can come up with 20 amazing ideas, but until you unpack each one and actually size and scope it and explore it more, it's kind of meaningless. So when you do impact versus effort in a workshop setting, after you, let's say you generated a ton of ideas and you're bringing 20 of them over and you're doing it a two by two, um, it's a little meaningless. Uh, because it, it's just the first, you have to recognize that's the very first pass because you're going to have no clue how much effort or impact some of these are going to have, are going to be, um, you're making your best guess. And so I think I go into that phase with very much a, we're just taking a first pulse check on what's bubbling up to the top here. And are there, are there some quick wins that we can just go do great tactical as Eric and I say in our framework, like these are tactical fixes. We're just going to go do them or are these strategic, um, and so we like to separate kind of the strategic efforts versus the tactical because the tactical things are just stuff you can pass to the backlog for your teams, right? It's like, great, let's just go do that. That's easy. But anything more strategic needs to be planned like a project. It needs to be scoped. It needs to be chartered. Resources need to get assigned. Who's going to own this? Um, and so oftentimes in this phase of a project, I basically put my PM hat on and I'm, P I'm coaching them on how to project manage this big backlog of work. And if they really think this strategic thing is promising, I say, great, let's make a new project around this. Like we're gonna approach it just like we'd approach any project. What is it? What's the vision? So now we're envisioning, right? It's future state because you've got ideas. So now you enter in with what is our vision? What are we trying to achieve? What's it gonna look like? Let's break it down. Let's do a blueprint, a future state blueprint. Let's map it all out. How are we going to implement this? What are the resources needed? So, you know, future state blueprinting is a great tool to use at that point where you're saying, great, we want to have this new experience, but we don't know the size and scope of it. And when you do a future state blueprint, you start to map out all the reality of the service delivery required to create that experience that you are dreaming about. But until you blueprint it out, you're not going to know. And so, our future state blueprinting method, that's what we use when we get to that phase of a project because it, it basically helps you test the feasibility of ideas. Um, so those are just some of my thoughts. I mean, it's this is a sticky part of any project, especially because at this point, a lot of, uh, you enter a phase that I call the strategy phase. So it's no longer, you're not, you're in between like ideation and implementation, right? It's the strategy phase. And what I've noticed, depending on the, again, the level of Zoom of these ideas, are they tactical or strategic? You have to engage different stakeholders in that strategy. And so this is a, how my practice of facilitating strategic planning emerged because we would hit these points on projects where we did a huge discovery effort. And now the leadership need to convene to come up with their strategy. And it's a way bigger than just service design at this point. This is business strategy we're talking about. Like what is our strategy for this and the service design piece comes later when you're like okay great we're now aligned on our strategy so it's almost you have to pause your service design work and go do strategic planning work and then come back and do like future state blueprinting so <laughs> um robin i think you have a hard stop you have one more question before you have to go yes and i haven't been keeping track of where how far we've answered um there was a, a interesting question from uh, Kinsey that I was actually chiming in on about uh, levels of Zoom, but specifically taking account for organizational history and legacy aspect of the system. Oh. Yeah, that, so, was, that was a that was a good one. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good meaty. I work in a higher ed environment, right? And it's as crazily decentralized as you could ever get. It is, especially at Stanford. It's like the it is a whole unique beast and there's bureaucracy and there's compliance and there's federal regulations and there's title nine and there's, I mean, you name it, higher ed's got it. Um, so 
yes, uh, acknowledging historical baggage and politics, where people are coming from. Again, you got to try to do your homework. And this might be one where you're, it's more like ask around, like go ask a PM who's been around a long time. They know. Uh, they know how to navigate the landscape. So I think find your find your people to kind of leverage your network and do some of that sleuthing in advance to learn about the organization. So find those people who are tenured, who can give you some of that historical perspective, just as like, you know, advice, right? But yeah, it's, it's tough and you do need to acknowledge it because I've seen team members go in blind and then they get caught way off guard and is they didn't know. They don't know. What we, we don't know what we don't know. Um, and I think being open and honest to recognize like, okay, I had a knowledge gap. Great. I'm going to pivot my approach. Yeah. That's sure. tough. Um, uh, I think Robin left. Brenda, do you have another question for me again? Yeah. Dana asked, if you had any examples of of the others that you discussed, those marginalized people using this information and navigate identity conflicts successfully. Hmm. Okay. Um, sure. So I one of my projects is between two entities. One is much more like a business and the other is much more uh, not like a business, not with the same bottom line. And um, the identities at play are, are, are very core values, right? Because people who work at a business align with the bottom line as a driver for their business um, and that their way is like, this is the way that we work. This is who we are as a business versus this other group um, has completely different core values and a different bottom line. And so unpacking the different interests and drivers and motivations and the business context between these two organizations took a long time. And what took a long time was getting them to understand the other point of view. Because it's, it's easy for me, I can like spot it and be like, yeah, you guys are coming from completely different points of view on this. But we had to spend a lot of time building trust across those two teams. Um, and understanding. And it took, it took, well, this project, I've been working on this for three and a half years um, as a facilitator. And it's, it's, you have to be willing to spend the time asking the questions and not assuming that people know about each other. What we realized in kind of turning over these stones was what something was so obvious to one side was absolutely unknown to the other side. And what's, it's obvious to me, but I had no idea that they didn't know. And so we had to kind of back all the way up and say, all right, about me 101, right? Like your team go first. Tell us about your business. Tell us about what matters to you. Tell us about at the end of the day, what are your bottom lines? What are you driving toward? What, how are you being, you know, assessed for performance? What are your metrics, right? So it's getting to know each other and our, the contexts of the team takes time. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my example. Awesome. That that's, that's super helpful. Thank you. Kate has another question. Um, can you speak to setting stakeholder expectations on the timeline when it comes to building alignment? So for, uh, therefore when you're scoping the project, letting your sponsors understand that the plan will change based on what you find. Yeah. And I think we can, the arc, you can kind of predict the arc, right? We're going to go from A to B and there's something in there that's going to be a little bit fluid. Um, you know, we do our best guess uh, to, to gauge that amount. And I think scoping, you know, clear estimating and scoping practices just takes time and experience. Um, like I said, I'm eight years in with my team. On average, we have 20 to 30 projects active at any given point. So you can imagine how many projects we have been through. And I think you just get better at that over time. And so if that's something you're still new to, just keep trying, keep going, <laughs> you, you know, and then do a retrospective, right? Like look back at the end of every project and reflect on what your estimates versus actuals were. What was your original plan versus how it changed and why? And then think about the contexts that maybe influenced why it changed. Um, and then you can do start to get better at kind of predicting 
Um, I would say we're we're pretty decent at predicting now as a team, except that the things out of your control are out of your control. And so projects always take longer than you think they do. <laughs> I have a little bit of a different question for you, Megan. There is there is some overlap between service design, strategic design, and business design, right? So a lot of the mm-hmm. same frameworks. Yep. Um, do you see more conflict um, or, or mediation to be had within a service design experience when you're actually just creating and enhancing a new service, or in a business design when you are literally um, retooling, resetting an entire line of mm. business and kind of mm. building a business from scratch. Do you see more pushback and challenges in business design, for example, even though it's very similar on the surface level? Yeah, um, yeah that's a good question. I um, I think I'd come back to my what I talked about with stakeholder complexity. So when you're doing like business strategy level work, um, usually that that is a leadership sponsored top down initiative of strategic planning of some kind and they've either assembled a leadership team to go through that process with you or they've decided to do a much more co-creative visioning and, and process which we've done all flavors um i would say because of the structure of those types of projects when you're at, doing more like a business strategy project it has more top down and it has um by nature i mean you have to have the leadership be bought in to decide on a business strategy right uh and so you get more sub teams falling in line, right? It doesn't mean there's not grumbling for sure, but I think the nature of those projects is different. I think conflict emerges more in service design work. One, because the leadership don't understand the fact that you are co-delivering a service across business silos and the leadership aren't even aware of the conflicting drivers and interests across these teams. And so when you step in it as a service designer, as we always do, um, you're stepping right in the middle of inter-team conflict that a leader leadership level may not even be aware of. So yeah, I do think more conflict emerges in service design work. Um, are there any more questions, Brandon? Uh, the last stated one is from a while ago. You were talking about one-on-ones. Mm. Um, and Kristen asked if you had a script template for those one-on-ones. I do. I haven't published it, but maybe I will. Yeah, something to consider. <laughs> Um, it's, yeah. this, this has been re- really, really, uh, cathartic for me. I'm in the middle of a project right now with a little bit of conflict as, as probably everybody joining, there's always some level of conflict. Um, right now I'm trying to help a client, uh, fix a 15 year old system. It was designed 15 years ago by a backend developer. And we've been working on transforming their, their contact center uh, you know, it's a call center and inbound outbound calling, not just their experience, but the software, which is the crux of it and improving the UX of it and, and how that affects services. And they're super adverse to change. People have been using this for 15 years. They know it like the back of their hand, every bad layout, every bad button, every bad form. And then of course, all the processes that stem all the things they have to do outside the software to manage that software. And we're trying to help them transform their overall practice, yeah. beginning with a little bit of software in the middle. And the conflict is is huge. Um, mm-hmm. Stakeholders have an idea of what they want, antithetical to what design practices would say. And, and then, of course, we come in trying to help them understand that I know I'm not a, a contact center professional, but... We've done some research. We have some expertise. We understand. We've looked at your people. Here's what we're prescribing, and they want none of it. None of it. So it comes back to the the serving, you know, the user and and the stakeholder. And the stakeholders want none of it. They just want a uh, lipstick on a pig solution. And and we're trying to offer a full service retooling, and and it's not happening. Uh, so it it's. It's top of mind to me. I, I don't really have a question. <laughs> I, I have an answer to you to your non-question. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, one of our team's very first big projects was this is digital transformation project, um, pl- replacing a legacy system uh, in a highly decentralized stakeholder environment uh, where everyone is a special snowflake, right? And we, um, it, what really helped in that process that was a role that we could play was in taking a co-creative workshop approach to build stakeholder alignment and co-design things together. I mean, that it, it, it is truly the power of what we do as service designers. And 
by nature, bringing people together to co-design means you're all work, you're separating people from the problem. You're all designing on together on a t as a team, right? So that plus change management strategy as integrated into your approach in, in that um, what we helped is design a stakeholder engagement, like a change champion type program that I ended up leading um, who could be kind of advocates out in the decentralized stakeholder landscape to in, you know provide updates and communications and get that buy-in and understand that you know and I know every digital transformation project project is different but I feel like as as in this as we operate a space as facilitators who are holding the interests of a good experience in mind and balancing that with the needs of the business you know we can help navigate that that tough environment of change and buy-in um, and use our co-design approach to do that. So I, that's my, I mean, that's my example of that, but I mean, that was a four year project. It was huge. Um, that's actually really helpful. You know, we, we skipped that, that part of the process. We're very close with this client. We've, we've had long, long running relation. We kind of thought that alignment was already mm -hmm. there only to discover after hundreds of hours of consulting hours that, it wasn't. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's new. I, this is a new problem for me I, because we, we never skip that step. Right. And, and I, and as you say, as you said that I was like, absolutely, yeah. we could, we could totally resync uh, through a workshop. It's never too late to no, call it's not. and say, we need to realign. We're going to pause and make sure we're all on the same page. It's never too late. Love it. Maybe you. Your core message is like conflict is good. Don't shy away from it. Well, yeah control it, manage it. Do you ever come out and say that? Or you kind of like slide it in and you know, no, oh, you yeah, I say it now. Now I do. Yeah. I mean, I've got, I've taken conflict mediation training. I have a coach, like I've, I've read books. I'm like, I'm pretty deep in now in this practice. So yes, I, I call it what it is. I'm, okay. And does that freak people out? They kind of like, they just, a bit. Like, right. I mean, different work cultures are either accepting of conflict or not. And I work, I happen to work in one that's like, Ooh, don't conflict. Um, but it's refreshing, I think, for people when they see a smiling face, who's got their back, who they trust, who's like, it's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, if there are any more questions, uh, Brandon, I think we can just wrap this up. Uh, we went a bit long. Um, do you have anything to add, Megan? Anything that's Super no, I just want to thank everyone for attending today and engaging with me and the thoughtful, super thoughtful questions. I hope this has been valuable. I hope it inspires you to take a new look at your practice um, and just think about it a different way. Think about your work in a new way. So thanks, everyone. It's been really great to see all of you. Thank you so much, Megan. I hope we, uh, we talk to you more than once a year. Uh, always inside Twin good to have you. And, and we try to find a more uh, thing to talk about with you. Hopefully not once a month, but more than once a year. Awesome. Uh, Thanks, maybe everyone. We'll you, uh, maybe we'll see you in Berlin for the conference. If not, we'll see uh, you. Not this year, sadly, you know, but um, hopefully at some point. And maybe if we do a U.S. conference, I'll definitely be there. Cool. Thank you so much, Megan. And thank Thanks, you for everyone. joining us. And we will see you next week with uh, Stephen Anderson. It's going to be a very playful look at how you can actually use board games and cards to do some really fun series and activities. So a bit of a different... Um, uh, topic, but just as much fun as Megan's. Thank you so much for your help again. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye.